Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Pat McDowell, and in addition to podcasting, I'm a leadership development and mastermind coach, a speaker and an author, and yes, check out my book. It's also titled Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. Thanks for listening, and if you are a podcast enthusiast, please help us make this podcast show even better. Just go to the PattonMcDowell.com website, and you'll see a pop-up you can't miss. Just give us five minutes of your best ideas, and we'll review every one, and certainly welcome your ideas around topics and guests going forward. Well, I know you're going to enjoy this fantastic conversation with Alex Romero, who brings great experience both as a former nonprofit CFO, but now as a virtual CFO. She sees the challenges you're facing especially in the areas of financial management. How do we effectively manage our budgets? Do we create internal controls that are essential for organizational success and and ultimately community confidence? Alex shares three fundamental pillars of financial management, and I think she's right on target. You need to be competent and confident in, number one, establishing internal controls at your nonprofit, Number two, assuring that all compliance standards are being met. And number three, keeping your board happy. Uh, I know many of you have interesting relationships with that group of leaders, and Alex is going to help you do it even more effectively. In fact, she'll explain all three of these concepts and give you advice to address them if they are in need of some attention. Lots of reasons to check out the show notes for this episode. It's number 173. Just go to the new podcast page at PattonMcDowell.com and you'll find out all of the resources mentioned as well as more information on Alex and the great work she's doing through Chris Hershevon CPA. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Alex Romero. Alex, thank you for joining me on the path. Yes, it's great to be here. Thank you. I'm excited about this conversation because this topic is sometimes not exciting to many nonprofit leaders listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, the management of budgets and finances is often, uh, I would suggest, an intimidation, for particularly for aspiring leaders that otherwise want to be in an executive or CEO chair. But this is not something they've grown up with. And so I'm excited to talk to you about you know practical advice um, that can help our listeners understand what it means to manage the finances, as the title of this episode implies. In fact, let me start with that, Alex. What what do you see as you work with nonprofit leaders, uh, some of the biggest financial challenges they're facing? Yeah, I would say that the biggest things that they're facing is not understanding the importance of restriction tracking within their financials, and then also being intimidated by the financial statements and the finances in general, the organization, and rather than trying to um, either learn more or get the appropriate help, they just kind of shy away from it. And so it's something that it's always going to be there. And so just having at least a general understanding is really going to be, is going to take you a long way in your leadership. Yeah, so well put. And again, I know you're going to help us maybe reduce some of that fear. And Mm -hmm. I agree. I I think both staff and often volunteer board members uh, will look and not fully understand some of the financial information presented, uh, but they don't want to say anything. You know, they don't want to raise their hand. But if if you could clarify the restricted funding element for those listeners who may not understand what that means, what do you mean by that? Yes. So restricted Funds, meaning that any grants or donations that you receive that somebody has said for a donation, I want to make sure that this only goes to this project or this event. And with grants, a lot of times grants are for a specific need. Sometimes you do have grants that are going to be for general expenses, but the majority of them are for specific items. And so making sure that you are spending the money based on what those restrictions are. Yeah, I appreciate that definition because you're right. Um, It's not just a cautionary tale because you could get in trouble, which Mm -hmm. perhaps you could, but also obviously it's not going to help your donor relations or your foundation relations if you're not 
correctly managing the funds as they intended it to be managed. Mm -hmm. So glad you lift that up. I know you're going to get more into that in terms of all of these issues, how we can better manage. But let's talk about your journey. You have actually mm -hmm. been in the nonprofit CFO chair, but talk about your journey that's led you to the work you're doing now. Yes, absolutely. So I have been on all sides of the nonprofit sector. I first began my career as an auditor, and a lot of that was within nonprofit organizations. So I've seen that side of it. And then, as you indicated, I most recently was the chief financial officer for uh, the Pueblo City County Library District, and they are a special district government agency, but also a nonprofit with a nonprofit foundation. So I've been on all sides of it, and I've also been a board member and treasurer for a lot of nonprofit organizations in my volunteer work. Yeah, I, I know you had such a good grasp of this topic, not just because <laughs> of the technical expertise you bring from your your training, if you will, as an auditor and, and finance person. But I guess in particular with the, the Puebla City County Library District, it, mm -hmm. were there any headlines from that experience that I guess apply now to when you're working with a nonprofit person as well? Yes. So just being able to understand the complexity of not only having uh, the organization be a special district within the government, but with the having it be a nonprofit as well. So we still had to make sure that we had all those budgets, that we were adhering to any of the generally accepted accounting principles. And then we did have a board of trustees and they were a very involved board, but still being able to speak to the finances and have everybody well informed including our other departments so our community relations they were in charge of the donors and seeking grants so it was just making sure that all the information that was needed by each individual was relevant to them and also something that they could understand yeah i'm so glad you put it that way and i i guess specifically in that setting or maybe in other settings you've seen is there a, an initial onboarding or orientation when a new person joins the staff or the board to understand the finances or did you find you were kind of training and educating on the go yes actually when we do have uh when we had new board members or staff especially those that were going to be in a management position we did do a training and so i would sit with them and explain kind of what the whole year looks like as far as what they could expect with the finances so at the beginning of the year this is when you can start using your budget when we would be looking at creating the budget and a lot of the those that were in the management roles they were the ones that would be initially creating those budgets for their departments so really having a strong understanding of what that meant and what they were expected to know but also that we were there as the finance team to help and help them navigate through anything that they might not understand completely and yeah, then love, talking about the budget approval process and everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt you because I love no, that. No, you're fine. And, yeah. And, and I find, I think you're the exception in that description. Um, and again, I'm, I'm being intentionally provocative to our listeners because mm -hmm. I don't think we as nonprofit leaders often provide the orientation for staff and volunteers, particularly board members. We assume mm -hmm. they understand. You know, mm -hmm. and I remember as a young professional for the Special Olympics organization, you know, I was given the three ring binder with budgets and finance and stuff, but I didn't fully mm -hmm. understand it. But it sounds like you take the time, at least in that setting, to to really explain how it works. Yes, absolutely. So they will be provided with all of the information so that they if they want to or they do have a deeper understanding, they have all of that. But yes, just being able to go through and describe what the revenue is, how do we get it, what are our expenses, and just just laying out a general idea so that they don't feel intimidated and they do have some understanding when we might discuss something that's a little more specific within there. 
Yeah, uh, again, I hope this is a call to action for our a listener right now thinking, one, did you get the kind of orientation you needed uh, mm-hmm. or are you getting it now in terms of your current role? Or if you are the leader, are you providing this orientation that Alex, you know, you just described? Um, mm-hmm. if, yeah, Alex, talk about the work you do now. W- what does it mean to be a virtual CFO for nonprofits? Yes. So um, I am a virtual CFO for Chris Hervishan, CPA, CDA. And so one of the things that we provide is services for nonprofits. And we do those for a variety of different size nonprofits. So we have um, different tiers for the services that a nonprofit would need. And so what I really saw coming into this role is that there's a lot of nonprofits out there that have a great need in their finance they might not be able to afford somebody that has the technical expertise to be a finance leader or they have somebody maybe on their board that's a volunteer and those can only be really used people only generally want to do that role for a couple years in a volunteer status so having something that's permanent that you can count on that's going to be able to provide accurate information and make sure that you're compliant is key and so what we provide at our firm is all the necessities that you need to be able to have a full finance department but at the cost of less than just having a, somebody that would be a bookkeeper status that has skills and knowledge around nonprofits. So we ha- we'll be able to speak with the board, we can do budgets, we will work with the outside auditors, just all those basic things and then the restriction tracking with the grants and donors. So anything that's very specific to a nonprofit we're able to provide that service so that you have the ease that it's being taken care of and you're well informed, but that you have a team behind you that has a deep understanding of what it means to have a successful financial position within the nonprofit sector. Yeah, well put. And I'm seeing more organizations, particularly medium and small nonprofits, who are entertaining the value of what you described, you know, the outsourced Mm -hmm. partnership. Um, Because to underscore what you said, Alex, many nonprofits can't afford the kind of talent and experience you can bring and your firm Mm -hmm. can bring. And you're right. I think a lot of nonprofits that make the mistake of what I would describe as interim financial management, you know, it's that board member, Mm -hmm. as you said, that maybe gave us oversight, but he or she's going to rotate off or... Mm -hmm. Or I'm I'm hiring, frankly, a junior staff member and hoping they have the experience, but frankly, they may not. And Mm -hmm. I'm guessing, are those the kinds of environments you're running into, organizations that either have someone that's junior or they've had volunteer management? Yes. And so I saw that a lot as being a volunteer on boards. I was always, as soon as I said I was a CPA, <laughs> I became the new treasurer. And yes. and they said, you know, we have been needing somebody that's been, that needs to do the finances for us. And then as an auditor as well, there were many organizations that we went into that they had somebody um, that they would be able to afford, but didn't understand nonprofit accounting. And And therefore, it just made the audit, sometimes we couldn't even complete it. They would have to bring someone else in to go through and correct everything before it could even be at an audit status. And so now with my position, I'm able to be that person that is going to help and have a team and really have those that are in the nonprofit already, the executive directors and the board, have them focus on the mission and the vision and not be so concerned and tied up with everything on the compliance side. Let us take care of that and we'll inform you so that you can do the mission better. So well put. And, And again, I've been guilty in organizations of which I've been a part you're right. You go down a checklist of board recruitment and you think, all right, let's get a finance person. 
Mm-hmm. And, and that may or may not be the right finance person, may certainly doesn't guarantee continuity. It's kind of mm-hmm. like Alex. I see a lot of organizations will say we need an attorney for all of our legal matters, <laughs> but mm-hmm. the attorney you recruit may or may not have the expertise, right? Just like the yeah. quote finance, just because you get a local banker on your board doesn't mean they can do the kind of things you do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, because it is it, nonprofit accounting. There's just a few differences there that are key. And if you don't have the understanding and the training and the knowledge of what that is, unfortunately, you're not going to be as helpful to the organization as you would want to be in that position. Yep. Right on target. Mm -hmm. Alex, I love how you helped orient me with their three principles that I want to talk about and get your advice for a nonprofit leader to consider. Uh, And they are establishing internal controls, Mm -hmm. compliance, and keeping the board happy, <laughs> which I mm-hmm. think is funny, but uh, it, it, well, it's not going to be funny if it's not done well. So let's go down those yes. big three. Uh, let's call them the big three from Alex. Mm-hmm. Number one, what do you mean by establishing internal controls? And maybe give me an example of that if I'm a nonprofit leader. Yeah, so establishing internal controls is a whole slew of different things that you can do to make the finance aspect of your organization less risky. And if you are a nonprofit that needs to have an audit or a review completed, this is something that they're going to be looking into, this internal control. So what that really specifically means is segregation of duties so making sure that not one person is able to collect the mail make the deposits and then also issue checks sign checks that's just the law on one person so you need those to be split so that one person is going to be approving invoices and another person is going to be issuing the checks and then maybe the board is the one that is going to be seeing and approving all the expenses as they go out in a month and that can be difficult in nonprofits because some of them are small and there's not a lot of people to be able to do that. But that's one of the benefits of what we provide is that we're an outside agency so that that's another layer of separation is that if somebody's doing something internally and then we're the next ones cutting those checks after it's been approved, that's a level of separation of those duties. Also making sure that you have correct approvals for purchasing. So making sure that you receive receipts for reimbursements, that if you have dollar amount levels, if you have managers, they can only approve up to maybe $1,000. Your executive director can only approve up to maybe 10,000. And then anything above that needs to be a board approval. Right. Yeah. You help. I'm guessing particularly smaller organizations or startup organizations, I guess you're helping them establish some of these policies and procedures because I'm Mm -hmm. assuming they are not in place when you arrive. Um, And is that something, again, that you help establish? Yes, that is one of our services, and that's actually in the bottom tier because it is so important that we want to make sure that you do have internal controls. And if you don't, that's okay. We can start now and we can look at what can be done right away. And especially with that separation, if you're using outsourced accounting, there in itself is going to add that level of separation. And so it's something that you can always add to. And even if it's something you haven't done in the past, you can do it going forward. And so it it is, it's something that we want to make sure it's top of mind and address so that you don't get in a situation that you weren't expecting. I mean, nobody thinks that anyone's going to do something incorrectly or anything that is maybe fraudulent within the finances, but just having that layer of protection and uh, risk adversity is going to be huge for a nonprofit. Well, you make a good point because I think the, the, the great majority of, of nonprofit leaders are well-intentioned, but it would seem to me what you're describing, Alex, is there's just potential for mistakes too. If I'm doing, mm-hmm. as a leader, I'm doing all of these elements and not uh, spreading the risk out, so to speak. Of course, 
if there is fraudulent activity, that often that's where I assume it would occur, right? If one person's mm -hmm. handling all layers or all elements of financial transactions, that's where you can get mm -hmm. in trouble. Yeah, and a lot of times it's just going in and educating the individuals that the controls and the processes that you're putting into place is to protect everyone. Yeah. So if you're the person that's counting the cash, if there's now something that says you have to do another step to that, that's to actually protect you so that if there is money missing, you can say, oh, no, I went through every single step. It wasn't me. Yes. So understanding it's not a, it's not a, oh, we're going to, we got you. We're going to make sure that you're not doing anything wrong. It's like, no, actually it's a way to protect yourself so that if anything does happen, you can go back and say, no, we, we have all these processes and procedures in place and it had to be something else. Yep. Great reminder, Alex. And I'm glad, again, our listeners can kind of file that away now that you've covered the internal controls concept and mm -hmm. how it applies and how it can protect us. Let's talk about the, the second of your three pillars, the, the compliance element. What do mm -hmm. you mean by compliance from your vantage point when you work with nonprofits? And what's an example maybe to assure they maintain it? Yes. So a lot of this goes back to the restriction tracking. So compliance being making sure you comply with those restrictions that a donor or a grant puts in place and being able to track those and have it so that when you get to the end of a grant and you have to present a report saying what you did with the funds, how successful it was, you have all that information. And so therefore you're being compliant with the grant and are more likely to get that grant in the future. Same with donations. If you're able to tell a donor that, yes, we did use your money to do this event. Here is something that came from that event. Here are pictures or whatever it may be. Also, your nonprofit status. So if you are a 501c3 or c6, making sure that you're having your tax returns filed every year. If you don't do that for three years, you will lose your nonprofit status. So making sure that you are keeping that into compliance and then following uh, generally accepted accounting principles if specifically you are going to be needing an audit or a review. Love that definition or multiple definitions there. And mm -hmm. I'm glad, Alex, you remind us that um, compliance also can be used in terms of donor stewardship. As a fundraiser mm -hmm. myself, um, it's nice to reassure the donors that you have these processes in place. It gives them confidence, right? That yes. not only did I use your money the way you intended, you can have confidence that we know how to manage it. And, and mm -hmm. so I would think uh, this information you're providing should go in my annual report, uh, I guess, in, or a gift acknowledgement, right? Mm -hmm. there, I, there are other ways, I guess, to lift up the organization's credibility through this compliance discussion. Yes, and if you do add that stuff in an annual report, that'll help even potential donors see how serious you are about making sure that you use the funds correctly and that you're furthering your mission. Yes, great point. Well, let's move to the third pillar. And again, nonprofit leaders, current ones certainly can appreciate this one, keeping my board <laughs> happy. Because sometimes mm -hmm. they, they're micromanaging me. <laughs> sometimes I can't get them to pay attention. But either way, how do you view the aspect of keeping the board happy from the kind of virtual CFO chair? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think a lot of this goes back to even how you were describing what our process was where I was um, at the Pueblo City and County Library District is that making sure at first that you train them and so they have an understanding of their requirements and the finances because a lot of times you're asking your board to go out and be that face and try and drum up new donations. But really what what this is speaking to is providing the appropriate amount and level of detail around the finances. So you want to make sure that your board feels well informed without being overwhelmed with too much information. So it's important to go through and describe key pieces. And if there's something that is changed or 
say you did receive a large donation, describing that to the board so that they know of that, but not getting in the weeds with them so that then they start feeling overwhelmed with just the sure amount of information they have been provided. When, when you've seen the ideal board training, I guess it would be part of a new board member orientation. I mean, is this an hour long event? You know, what, when you see it done well, how much in, yeah. is involved in a board training, if you will, around the finances? Yes. So I would say initially there would be a one hour event where you just go over the basics. And then as the board member is going to be with the board, they will see the budget process and other items. But I think it's important that they really speak to the finance leader or whoever is in charge of the finances and have that initial hour orientation so that then they understand who they can go into to ask questions and feel comfortable that they can that they can say i don't understand this piece and just making sure that you're have that open communication and an avenue that they feel that they can go and they can get more if they need to. And so it's just key to start the relationship off right so that your board starts happy and understanding and have a better sense of what their role is going to be within knowing the finances of the organization. I'm struck by your idea there of, of almost creating a frequently asked questions document. I'm imagining mm -hmm. if I'm a new board member, knowing who mm -hmm. to ask. And again, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we assume that's obvious, but it may not be to a new board member. So you mm -hmm. could provide, uh, here's here's the information, here's who you go to, I guess, mm -hmm. if it's not evident, if you have a question. In fact, when when you present kind of the, the board meeting, the typical financial reports, mm -hmm. I've seen all shapes and sizes, you know, from the 20 pages of printouts, <laughs> which by the way, I think nobody reads. Or, yeah. But what does the ideal board report look like for the finances? Is there kind of a narrative cover page that helps explain it? Or what, what do you think are key characteristics in reporting? So what I have done in the past is I've provided the financial statement. So having, um, and there's different words that are used with nonprofit accounting for the different financial statements, but having the balance sheet and an income statement so that you can see those and then also going through and I've found it important to show the expenses for the month and especially if you have purchase cards and you have employees that are using that having all those listed out and then what I would typically do is go through the financials and highlight items that were of note or if there was anything that had changed or large things that happened in the month. And same thing as with the expenses, going through those and if there are new ones or large ones, describing that, but then also having a time that the board can ask questions. And so I would come prepped. I would know if I thought maybe something would be asked about or if not, if they ask about something that you weren't ready to discuss, telling them that, let me look into that, I'll provide you the information, but actually doing that, then going back and giving that information to the board member so that they realize that if they do have questions, it's going to be taken care of. It's going to be um, seriously something that's going to be looked into and something that will be addressed. Yeah, again, I uh, appreciate your approach there, highlighting things that need to be uh, lifted up that maybe are unusual. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, you're helping train me as a board member, right? You're educating me as to what to look for by mm -hmm. highlighting those things that maybe are unusual. Um, it, it seems to me all three of your your teachings here are these pillars uh, would prepare an organization for a word that's sometimes scary is the audit. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about the, the audit or the preparation for an audit. I, I guess internal controls and compliance create mm -hmm. an environment that helps you prepare for just yes. that. Yes, and making sure that you're doing monthly reconciliations of your bank accounts so you can ensure that there isn't anything on there that you don't understand or wasn't approved. 
I mean, it might not even been something that you had done. You know, there's there's many things out there that will go and um, there might be something that's fraudulent on the outside, somebody having access to your account. So that's important. And then making sure that you have documentation and you have all of your expense tracking and everything in line so that you're able to describe in detail those pieces that make up the financial statements so for everyone else management and leadership team board of directors you try and keep everything at a higher level but the audit is kind of the opposite of that you want to make sure that you have the details covered but also the narrative that goes along with how are you protecting the financials? What are those controls? What what are you presenting? What are you talking about? Um, and that, those are just a few steps to kind of get you ready for an audit. Yeah, well put. And again, good um, education as to a process that may be scary. But again, if we follow your advice, as you have noted earlier, Alex, the audit process should go mm -hmm. better and then again serves as a stamp of approval right a, a confidence mm -hmm. builder to all of our constituents that we are managed well um, let me ask you about another concept that i think can be difficult for nonprofit leaders particularly when our revenues are inconsistent you mm -hmm. know grants or fundraising and things like that so talk about how can a leadership team better manage and i guess forecast cash flow yes and so looking at cash flow for a nonprofit is very important and especially the way that grants are um, recognized within a nonprofit so the majority of them when you receive those funds if it's for three years you're going to have all that revenue in that year and it's going to make your financials look very strong and then in the next two years when you're still expensing towards that grant you won't have that revenue on the income statement showing that money that you're spending so it's important to not only have your financial statements that would be audit ready but to have it based on the cash flow and what money is coming in, what money's coming out, what money are you actually spending? And that way you can see if there are some areas that you need to concentrate on. Well, maybe we need to ramp up our fundraising or are there areas we can cut expenses? So having a, having a deeper sense of what cash is available and for what purpose? What what time period do you recommend organizations as they plan um, budgets? Obviously, are typically an annual planning exercise, but do you get into longer term financial forecasting with organizations or does it depend? It depends, but I have always been a fan of doing long range financial planning just so that you can think of some of those things that you want to do in the future and in a perfect world, how would you get there? What what steps do you need to take to, say, build a new uh, clubhouse in five years? What do we need to do to be able to afford that? So I think that having, you know, something that as far as a 10 year plan could be beneficial, knowing that after a year or two, a lot of that is going to be assumptions and will need to be changed periodically. But at least it gets you thinking about what you can do, what you want to do, and how you would do it. Yeah, I'm glad you left that up because you're right. Many nonprofits have capital expenditures they're pondering, you know, mm -hmm. should we have a campaign to build that new building or whatever programmatic mm -hmm. expansion? I guess the other area that is often a, a large expense item, of course, is personnel. So mm -hmm. are, are you involved in that, I guess, evaluation of, of current personnel expenses and then potential growth and timeline for that? Yes, that's another thing that we do offer within our services is looking at the compensation and making sure that those are in line with what's being paid because that that's another thing that 
you know, personal expense is a large amount of what you're spending your dollars on, but also you need to make sure that you're paying your people appropriately to get the expertise you need to be able to fulfill your mission and your vision. So it's a delicate balance between making sure that you're paying appropriately so you have the most skilled individuals, but also keeping the budget in mind so that you have not only the people to do the work, but the money to actually produce and be able to do those programs and services. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And mm -hmm. well, Alex, if I, I'm thinking about virtual CFO support, like uh, someone like you could provide Again, I guess it could be scaled in different ways. In other words, you could become literally my full-time CFO, or if not full-time, or could you then support, if I have, let's say, a junior person on my staff, do you mm -hmm. sometimes come in and help and train and support that person, or is it all or nothing? So we do a little bit of both. What, what our ideal situation is, is that we would be the full accounting department, finance department, so that we can put in place all of our processes and procedures and automation around our the way that we do the accounting work on our side. But if there is somebody that is in a bookkeeper position that is able to do some of that on the front end, we would certainly work with them as well and then help with the higher, you know, senior accountant, director, CFO services that the nonprofit would need. Well, again, it's fascinating. And I think an important element for nonprofit leaders to consider that perhaps historically we've thought about these functions as they go out and hire somebody full time. But mm -hmm. given the the technology, particularly virtual access, I'm guessing too, Mm -hmm. um, that allows you, Alex, to access organizations that don't just have to be in your town. Is that true that you're able to provide these services largely on a uh, in a virtual setting? Yes, that is very true. So our team is actually all across the United States. And so it does allow us being virtual to provide these services to any nonprofit within the U.S. And we also have it so that we can be available for board meetings and we also ask that we be involved in leadership meetings so if you yep. do have a weekly leadership meeting we're there as the finance person and being able to hear and describe what we know on our side as well yeah it seems to me the more we involve you the more you can help us right yeah and again Absolutely. the technology allows it and mm -hmm. you give us a degree of expertise i'm, I'm glad you raised this point because i just think Nonprofit leaders need to consider um, the type of talent they need to take their organization to the next level. And it may be difficult to hire in-house functions mm -hmm. like what you provide. So you've definitely helped me get more confidence around mm -hmm. these financial uh, concepts. So, we, you know, internal controls and compliance and audits and things that if I'm going to move into senior leadership in the nonprofit sector, I've got to be comfortable with that. And is there any other advice, Alex? This has been fantastic. Any other advice for a nonprofit leader wanting to advance and maybe still struggling with some of these concepts? Yes, I would just say that really understanding and knowing that you can seek outside help and that you just having a general understanding of what the finances are is enough. And you can put all that detail with somebody that loves it and understands the process and knowing that you can be the best at your leadership because you know that there is somebody that's taking care of all the finances on the other side, on the back end. And I feel like a lot of times nonprofits, they just, they are, they're intimidated with how do we raise this money? How do we make sure that we're doing, we're being good stewards of this money, that we're doing everything correctly, and it can be intimidating. And it's often put on the back burner because it's something that's not in their wheelhouse. And that's okay, because there's a lot of people out there that are able and wanting to help nonprofits succeed. And that's what we are really looking at. We, as an organization, we really want to help the nonprofits focus on what's most important to them and us take care of the, the finance side and those 
compliance and the internal controls and the audit and being there for the board and all those different aspects that can be um, sometimes not something you find easily, especially at a lower dollar amount that a nonprofit may be able to spend in that capacity. Well put, Alex. Thank you for the encouragement mm -hmm. uh, on a topic that may not be as exciting for some listening, <laughs> but you've made it more accessible for sure and more mm -hmm. reason to check out the show notes for this episode so people can find you and the great work you're doing. But first, let me ask you for a parting gift, if I might. As you yes. know, I ask every guest to share a book maybe that's been meaningful to you on your journey or you think might be worthy of our, our listeners thinking about to add to their list. Yes. So I am a huge Brene Brown fan. And so um, the one that I'm listening to right now, again, is Daring Greatly. And so I just always find her teachings and her books to just be very powerful and something that is helpful for a lot of different leaders in all different types of businesses. Could not agree more. Thank you for lifting that up. We will include it in the show notes as well, as well as uh, more to connect with you. In fact, why don't you tell our listeners, where can people go to find out more about you and the great work you're doing? Yes. So um, you can visit my firm's website, betterwaycpa.com. And then I'm also on LinkedIn and Twitter and under Alex Romero CPA. So you can find me on either of those sites as well. That's awesome, Alex. Thank you so much for joining me on the path. Yes, thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Alex as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas to guide your leadership journey, especially as it relates to the mastery of the financial acumen necessary for nonprofit leadership. Don't forget to check out the show notes. This is episode number 173. You can go to PattonMcDowell.com. Go to the podcast page and you'll find out more about Alex and the great work she's doing with many nonprofit organizations as a virtual CFO. As always, thanks for sharing this episode with somebody else on the path. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast. Go to that podcast page again at PattonMcDowell.com and you will see the follow button. Follow equals subscribe and it will make sure that you don't miss on any of these weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday on whatever podcast platform is preferable for you. Thanks again for all you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. Keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week and I'll see you next time on The Path.